We have the privilege of having Dr. Kosla with us. He is, uh, he was the eighth, mm -hmm. he's the eighth chancellor of UC San Diego. Right. And he's been uh, there since 2012. And since his time there, I actually watched his uh, videos on YouTube, 2012, 2016, 2018. The progress and the growth of UC San Diego has been uh, pretty remarkable. And to say there's a fellow IIT, and so what if he's from IIT Kharagpur? Um, he's still at IIT. What do you mean, so <laughs> what? That's the IIT. <laughs> IIT Kharagpur to IITs is what <laughs> Cal is to the UC system. Yeah, perfect. Uh, he told me that, earlier. Did I get that, that right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. He, uh, before um, becoming the chancellor, um, uh, Dr. Kosler spent most of his career with uh, Carnegie Mellon University, where he did his master's and his PhD there and went on to become an associate professor, went on to become a university professor with a distinct honor, and then became a dean as well uh, in uh, 1980, uh, 2004, mm -hmm. actually. Um, he is from IIT Kharagpur. He graduated in, in uh, 1980. And he did tell me that um, we can ask him candid questions. And candid questions will get you candid answers. So beware, you may not be able to handle the answers. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this all day long, you've been very good. You've been giving us a good set of questions. Um, yeah, we were comparing Anda Paratha between IIT Delhi and IIT Kharagpur. Uh, so he, he's game for this. Um, so there are still the cards on your table. Do write your questions. Do write your name and your IIT if you, if you want that to be recognized. And send over the questions. because. I, it is my honor to be interviewing Dr. Kosla, but I'm sure the audience has better questions or more interesting questions um, than I would have. Um, so thank you, Dr. Kosla. One of the first things that, um, that I find remarkable about you is uh, you moved from uh, Pittsburgh, small town, to a large, 30-some uh, years in Pittsburgh, <laughs> Pennsylvania. I know because I spent half of that time in Pittsburgh. So I need to get a controversial question out of the way first. Okay. <laughs> Pittsburgh Steelers, Penguins, or Pirates? None. <laughs> I have my husband in the audience, and he's probably very unhappy with the answer. No, look, my family, like my wife and my kids, they're all Steelers and Penguins, but uh, I watch only football, and I watch after the playoffs begin, and I pick the team that I think is playing a fast game, and that's it. I don't care where they're So from. you always pick the Patriots, then? And used to be the Niners, and used to be the Broncos, and you know everybody gets a chance uh, over time. <laughs> so um, I, I bring up Carnegie Mellon because it, that's a small private uh, institution compared right. to what you're running today. Right. How did you make the transition from that scale to a scale that you're running today? So you know I honestly don't have a formula on how I made the transition. So in fact, when they called me to interview for the chancellor's position at UC San Diego, I had been dean for like seven, eight, seven, eight years. And I said, you know, maybe if I'm going to start interviewing for positions like this, this would be a good practice. Because you've got to be crazy to offer me this job. Uh, because I've spent 30 years in public, uh, sorry, private higher education. Yeah. So I just went there with like no preparation, like marginal preparation. Enough to not make a fool of myself and not make a fool of IITs. Uh, but, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, they actually, obviously they liked what I had to say. Uh, we had a match of uh, views and personalities. And when they offered me the job, in fact, Mark Udoff was the president, and he says, you know, I want you to know, this is a public institution. Everything is, you're, you're, within, you're living in a glass bubble out here. And I said, I used to be at DARP. I understand what that means. But honestly, I didn't quite understand what that means. But we'll come to that in a second. So the way I see this, uh, to me, the issue was not scaling from public to private, uh, or private to public. The issue was moving from family A to family B and adopting the new family as your own, regardless of whether they were public or private, and making sure that they adopted you as their own. Uh, and if you keep that open mind, I think that scaling or the transition becomes nearly trivial, at least for me it was. Okay. Not trivial, but nearly easy, yeah. At what point did you realize that administration and organizational building was what you wanted to do? So that was like in, so I became an assistant professor in 86. 
Uh, I became a full professor in 93, and uh, I wanted to just go do something else. And I just happened to be talking to the director of DARPA, briefing him on what I was doing for the DARPA program. And he says, yeah, why are you wasting your time with half a million dollars a year? Come work for me at DARPA, and I'll give you like tens of millions of dollars, and everybody will be at your beck and call. Uh, and I don't know how many of you all work for DARPA or have worked with DARPA, but it used to be very powerful. It still is very powerful. So I said, okay. So I took time off. I basically took three years off, and I worked there. Uh, and so DARPA, unlike most funding agencies, does not just hand out money. So the way it works is, as a program manager, you create a vision for a program. You would say something like, I'm going to reduce the cost of this missile seeker assembly by a factor of five. And the way I'm going to do it is by using, at that time, the web, uh, Mosaic was just announced, by using collaboration technologies, by using large-scale design tools. Uh, and then you get the money. And then now it's your job to go pick people all over the country uh, who would be programmatically involved in the program doing different parts of that project. So you structure a large project. Uh, and then you have these PI meetings every mm -hmm. two or three months. Yeah. So, and after about 18 months, I realized I actually enjoyed doing this. But I also realized that it was not good because here I was funding people's research that I could be doing but I was not allowed to do. So when I go back in three years, I'm like three years behind now because all of these other people have had uh, more publications, they have more capabilities, they have more students. Uh, but then I started taking uh, enjoyment in their success because I think I was pushing the agenda for the country and for the institutions and just for technology in general. So when I went back, I said, you know what, I'm still gonna do my own work, but I also wanna do institution building, or organization building. So that was the turning point actually. So you said you did not have a secret recipe, but it looks like doing the segue into DARPA may have made you more well-rounded for what uh, oh, yeah. another institution was looking for. No, it absolutely did, but I did not know that going in. I went to DARPA because I just wanted to do something different. I did not know that that was a path to something different, right? Yeah. So, from, But DARPA, I think, clearly added more than 10 years to my uh, academic uh, resume in terms of experience and stuff like so that. So would that be something, there are several academicians in this room today, would that be an advice you give them to look at things broader than what they are doing I, I would actually, I really would. Uh, and I would even look at uh, NSF as long as you don't become a bureaucrat. Uh, but I think it's worthwhile to go look at, but you have to do this honestly. You cannot do this purely to beef up your resume, because once, if you do it only for your resume, it shows in your performance. It shows in the way you interact with the community. It shows in the way you think about the program. And I have seen this at multiple agencies where they go, people go only to beef up their resume. And I can tell that they are not engaged in uh, doing the right things for the right reasons. They're engaged in only just uh, beefing up their resume. It tells in the quality well, of work. You, you yeah. can easily, tell. at least I know I can tell. I know many of my colleagues out here will be able to tell if you interact with people. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Uh, Dr. Costa, your education may be similar to some many of the people in the room, but your everyday issues and the challenges you face are on a different scale. Did you do anything to equip <clears throat> yourself to deal with, especially with personalities, politicians, um, professors, right. uh, media? So I, you know, so I've thought about this, and it turns out that I don't know what you do to deal with politicians or media. At the end of the day, these are all people. I think if you like people and you deal with people honestly, uh, most of the times your interaction will be fine. Every so often you'll make a mistake, but so what? Uh, you know, then they'll hit you and then you move on. Uh, so I personally, uh, whether it's my significant donors or Sacramento politicians or DC politicians, uh, they all have different interests. I always try to figure out what is this person interested in? How can I make this person uh, be successful at what they're doing? And in that process, how can they help me? And it turns out it works out to be a two-way street and you take interest in them, they will take interest in you automatically. So. So you didn't take some of the setbacks personally? Or if they didn't like something you did? Well, you know, you always take your setback personally, but not so personally that uh, 
you don't recover from it. You have to take it personally. I mean, after all, you have a little bit of an ego, and <laughs> because you don't, and you don't do something to be the wrong thing. You're trying to do the right thing, and it happens to be wrong on a relative basis. So. Okay. Between even between 2012 and now, a good seven years. What are the things you've become stronger at, and what have you deliberately grown? So I think I've grown tougher in terms of uh, taking hits from the media and the newspapers. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think I have grown um, more confident in believing what I am doing and that is the right thing, even though, so I'll give you an example. So you see San Diego, uh, I've announced that we are gonna be primarily a residential institution, which means I'm gonna offer everybody four-year housing guarantee uh, at 20% below market. Uh, now, this community around me in La Jolla, is La Jolla addresses, I don't know what would, La Jolla would be like uh, uh, Beverly Hills or like Atherton or like Greenwich, you know. People don't want growth. People don't want traffic. Okay. Uh, so, you know, and people do get back at you and there are these people pushing back and doing, playing dirty politics. But I do believe that what I'm doing is the right thing for the next generation of students and for UC San Diego. So you become tougher, you just hang in there, you just keep on doing it. So what do you, would you say is your leadership style today? So, okay, so I'll tell you what I think I'm doing, but that doesn't mean everybody looks at it and thinks that I'm doing it. But I believe if I'm doing what I think of as enabling and empowering everybody and controlling nobody. Now having said that, you cannot just enable and empower a large five and a half billion dollar institution and go to sleep. You have to have your finger on the pulse. And when you have your finger on the pulse, you're taking measurements of the system. You're trying to figure out who's doing what, are they making yeah. progress? And then there are people who interpret this as quote unquote micromanagement. Even though I'm not trying to manage them, I'm just trying to gauge their progress. Because after all, we're investing all this money so you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so, what, so my style is enable, empower, no control. But that doesn't mean there's no accountability. That doesn't mean my finger's not on the pulse. That doesn't mean I don't take measurements on a regular basis to see the pulse of the institution and progress. That's a, that's a good way to look at, um, could probably segue into the next question I had. Your stakeholders, there's so many, so mm -hmm. many facets. What would your advice be to people who put the priority of being liked over doing the thing that you believe in? So I think if you start with the premise that you want to be liked, you will end up with the result of not being liked. Because even when people superficially like you, they actually don't like you because people know that you're being fake. So I think you want to start with the premise of trying to do the right thing even when you disagree with the other people. So like for example, uh, there are constituencies on my campus that I disagree with, but then there are others that I agree with. Uh, and the answer is not just uh, proclaiming my answer is right, it is having a conversation as to why I disagree with you, understanding from your perspective why you think I'm wrong. And every so often, even when you are when you think you're 100% right, you should make adjustments in your strategy by listening to other people, thereby letting them know that you're listening to them and you accept their input and you respect what they have to say. Uh, because marginal changes on the edge don't make uh, your strategy completely different. Is this kind of making? Uh, yeah. yeah, so you're saying it's not always democratic, but uh, inputs come in from various facets because right. you see a perspective that's different from right. individual groups. But input is democratic. I mean, I would, on my campus I walk and I talk to the janitor and I talk to the dean and I talk to the EVC and I talk to everybody, which of course people at the senior level don't like because the low level people in their mind are not giving me the right input. But the low level people are feeling the pain. I wanna know what that pain is. I mean. <laughs> Yeah. The, the manager is not feeling the pain of the worker, and I being above the manager, I want to feel the pain of the manager and the worker and decide whose pain are we going to manage and how. Cool. How do you, thank you, how do you think about the complexity and the scale of complex issues that you deal with? 
Do you run them to the ground? Do you think, them, uh, think about them on a broader scale? So, first of all, I'm not the only one that's thinking about these issues. Uh, but I can tell you, when I go into a meeting, the likelihood that I have thought about that issue more than anybody else is extremely high. Because without that, as a leader, you cannot walk in uh, and reach a conclusion that would make sense. Uh, if you walk in with, uh, without having thought about the issue and your number three person has thought more, the number three person may know more, but that doesn't mean they have thought more, uh, two different things. Uh, you want the people who know more, but you want to be the person who's thought more about the issue. So you can ask questions and you can uh, uh, guide people through your questions, you can extract more information through questions, and at the end you have an answer. But you can't walk in not knowing and thinking that six out of six people will vote yes and then you're done. It doesn't work that way. I mean, most of your, uh, at least from, you know, I'm looking, I'm used to looking at 18 year olds on campus and when I was on IIT, everybody was 18 or 19 years old. So here I cannot believe we are all IITians out here. <laughs> There's very few 18, 19 year olds out here, so anyway. So you seem to be having a, something, a recipe that works for you. Um, because you're able to translate the way you're thinking into more ambitious goals. Right. Uh, the August 19th uh, um, uh, ad in LA Times says that you achieved <laughs> your $2 billion goal for UC San Diego, a target set for 2022. Right. Was already achieved. Thank you. Thank you. So you, have, you seem to be uh, playing by a different playbook in the world of uh, speaking the, in, the term, in terms of football. Yeah, I don't know if it is different. It's my playbook. I, if, just because you don't have it doesn't. <laughs> so what has the ability to set these goals and achieve these goals? What other changes have been brought about because of this uh, culture? So, so for example, uh, at UC San Diego, you know, how many of you have done a strategic plan in your life? Okay, so many of you, right? And how big is the plan? Five, seven, 10 pages, 20 pages, right? So you see San Diego, when I went there, we did a strategic plan, and it was eight words. So at the end of a year and a half, I said, the whole plan is eight words. And the way it's gonna work is every day you come to work, you figure out what these words mean to you in your job, and you just go do it. And then at the end of five years, seven years, we'll figure out where we are. So the eight words were student-centered, which means all choices we're gonna make, everybody, the janitor, the admissions person, the financial aid person, uh, my deans, what does student center mean to you in your job? You, I'm not telling you what the answer is. You tell me what it means and you just go do it. Second two were research focused, which means the emphasis on research. The third two were service oriented. And the idea here was that we're all in service of somebody else. I'm here serving somebody, somebody serving somebody else. So if you all wanna think that people work for us and we forget that we work for other people too at the same time. Uh, and the last two were public university. And the idea there was that look, you know it's very fashionable in California to say that the state does not support us. Uh, so we are a privately supported public institution. And I think it's fundamentally incorrect. I said we are a public university because of our charter. So even if the state doesn't give us much money, our charter, our mission is public. So we will always continue to be public. Uh, and that's it. So those were the eight words. So fast forward five years, seven years now. And I said, okay, the new vision for us, those eight words are still the strategy, but the vision now is one word, destination. And it's destination for students, patients, and the local community. And let's figure out what it means to be a destination for students, what it means to be a destination for patients and local community. And you know, simplicity like this empowers people. It forces them to think because it's so non-intuitive. Everybody's expecting the strategic plan to be the algorithm that is gonna tell them how to succeed and they will measure my success. And my view is, no, I'm measuring your success. We're measuring our success. Uh, we are not gonna make this plan measure my success. <laughs> I did read that here in the advertisement. It was readily um, digestible. Yeah, it's very simple. Yeah, yeah my mother understands this. That's perfect. <laughs> so um, compare and contrast for us the IIT and, uh, and the UC system, the curricula. Uh, what, how, how does each bring out the best in people? So, you know, I don't know. 
how to compare except to say what Kharagpur is to IITs is Berkeley to UCs. <laughs> uh, <I> mean, <laughs> <laughs> right, but I actually so I think uh, I think both systems are very competitive to get in. Yeah, uh, I think IIT is more brutal than not to get in. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally am a fan of the JEE, -E -E, but I'm not a fan of two years of preparation of JEE. -E. I think that is a complete disaster. It distorts uh, the type of people who get in. Uh, I think just because you passed, there was a difference, in, at least in my mind, in passing the JEE, where you studied for two weeks uh, and you went in and took the exam and uh, you made it, uh, versus studying for two years, understanding the type of questions that are being asked. And what people don't understand is become a game because the faculty on the other side know what's happening. So they twist the questions more. And in this case, I know these people who are setting the questions. Uh, they're all good friends now. So I'm thinking, like, this is complete stupidity. It's become like a two-party par, two uh, adversarial game rather than a way of honestly understanding your ability to think critically, your ability to understand some subtle, nuanced concepts uh, that you may not understand just by reading a book, right? So anyways, I'm not a big fan of the quota, quota KOTA, right? Yeah. So a um, couple of good questions here. You touched upon how you set the strategic plan, but you personally, how do you set your priorities? And what does a typical day look like for you? So, you know, I don't, my priority is to get up and survive the day. Actually, I was, my phone is out there. So a typical day, let's see, would look like uh, I start at about 7.30. It might be a meeting with the advancement team trying to create a uh, plan for, you know, the next, two weeks of uh, gifts and who we are going to ask and how we're going to strategize. Next meeting might be a meeting with the architects to look at a new building. A meeting after that might be a couple of parents. I'm looking at the next few days now who are visiting to drop off their kids and they want to meet with me. And this is amazing. They all want to meet with me and I'm thinking, the kid is sitting there completely embarrassing. What the hell are you doing, mom? <laughs> I, you know, but. But, but they're there. Uh, I'll tell you a story in a second. And then uh, the parents are feeling good about it. And they say, yeah, take care of my son or my daughter. I say, yeah, yeah, I will. The next time I see the son or daughter is like four or five years later after, well, on the graduation day. In the meantime, they have never come to me. And this has been the story all throughout. But nonetheless, the parents feel good. And I think it's my job to make sure they understand uh, that as the chancellor, I really care about, uh, which I do, about taking care of their kids. So it might be that meeting. It might be some meetings with my vice chancellors. It would be like sometimes you throw in a union meeting in there. <laughs> like, so it would be the point I'm trying to make is during my day, the context would change every 30 minutes. And you have to mentally shift from a very positive, uplifting meeting uh, to a meeting that's going to be a little bit strenuous and tenuous. Uh, and you have to be prepared for this. So, and most of these meetings go back to back. It's not like between meetings I have half an hour to go read up on my briefing. So I have to be prepared from the day before or the day before or whenever I get a chance, so. So there's a question from the audience on uh, your views on how much should the university work towards improve its ranking? Uh, so I, I don't know if a university should move towards improving its ranking for the sake of ranking. If you believe that the ranking really reflects some of your values, uh, and if you want to be improving yourself, then I think it's in your interest to do that. So I'll give you an example. So uh, take, for example, any ranking. They will have a four-year graduation rate as a criteria for the ranking, right? Now, if your four-year graduation rate is 30% and uh, you want to improve it to improve your ranking, I understand that. But independent ranking, you should be improving your four-year graduation rate anyway. Uh, so in that sense, I'm willing to accept the fact that you're doing it to improve your ranking because you're doing the right thing still, right? Uh, but trying to uh, cut corners to improve your ranking, 
So I'll give you an example of an institution. So four-year graduation rates, the way they're computed is, they're computed based on who's a freshman in fall of that freshman year, okay? So that cohort is tracked over four years. Now, if somebody joins January of that freshman year, that cohort, that person will not be factored into four-year ranking. So there are universities, some in California, um, that figured this out. So they would admit people who they thought could graduate in four years in the fall. The others they would send to a local community college and say, why don't you go take a math course, their English course, and come to us in January and we'll admit you, and you can start in the January semester. So that was clearly playing with the system. Now, doing that to improve your ranking, it, that doesn't make sense to me because that's like literally, uh, I don't know, it's, it's not good. It's like on the edge of ethics, I think, <laughs> of being unethical. I think uh, your t uh, conversation about strat planning uh, resonated quite a bit with the audience. I had a few questions. About uh, strategic planning? Strategic oh, okay. planning. All right. Um, the, one of the questions is uh, probably very germane. You, you do a simplified message at the top level. How do you perc let it percolate to different uh, functions, different parts of the organization, and how do you keep it coherent if it's that right. simple? Right. So I think, so this is where you got to have faith. If you believe that you, the leadership, knows the answers, and your people are clueless and they're waiting to be told what to do, then my method does not work. For this method to work, you have to feel that everybody who's coming to work is committed to coming to work, wants to do right by the institution, and will do right by the institution when given the chance. So when I say, when you come to work, whatever your job is, student-centered, figure out what that means to you and go do the right thing. Over time, what happens is there's 30,000 of you at UC San Diego. Uh, every so often you'll do things that, that kind of nullify each other, but overall, there would be, it's like a Brownian motion. There'd be a lot of Brownian motion, but overall there'd be displacement. It would not be a net displacement of zero. You would actually be making progress, and you can see that. You can see that every six months, every year. I see that by looking at, uh, how our financial aid offices work. Parents, do they complain to me or not? How the parking system works? I mean, very simple things, you know, because people will end up, end up coming and complaining to you. So you've got to have that faith. If you don't have that faith, then you've got to do a 30-page plan, which actually creates uh, milestones and parameters and metrics, and then you've got to start measuring your people. And you'll be called micromanagerial. Even no, you will <laughs> not actually. You know, some people like it, but I think... I think learning institutions that learn uh, inherently don't quite work very effectively with that. I think a learning institution should be allowed to just have some adaptation inside it, so. Okay, um, here's a good one. Oh, okay. IIT and the Indian community in general have made great uh, strides in academia and the IT, in the technology industry. Do you have an opinion on what's the next important front frontier we should be setting our sights on? The Indian community or the IITs? IITs and the intersection of both. Uh, I mean, look, I have my, are we talking in the US or? In the US, yeah. Look, the people who come here, you know, used to be when I came here, the only way you'd come here is if you're an IITian or if you're a doctor. And you came here to get a PhD uh, primarily, right? Now, there's a lot of people because of uh, the expanding economy, uh, because of uh, great IT companies, including my own, as in the one I'm involved with, TCS. Uh, we bring a lot of people here, enable, and they come and enable a whole lot of American industry, American companies, mm -hmm. uh, and they become a part of not just the society, but of the technology culture and of technology companies. So the generation of Indians who are here now are not primarily IITians. If you go to San Diego, if you go to the Bay Area, uh, used to be you'd look at only an I. Now it's not IITians. It's like people from everywhere. And I can tell you that makes me feel proud because that tells me that there are these smart people out there, even if they didn't go to IIT, it was not a black mark in their life. I mean, they still had the opportunity. I mean, we still gave them an to me, if there was one thing negative about the IIT, it was so elitist that if you didn't go to IIT, you were not smart enough and you were a loser. And that just did not make sense. It doesn't make sense now. And I'm glad that there are these 
so many people here who are not from IIT more successful than IITians. And there are quite a few non-IITians in the audience. Oh, is so that will, right? Okay. Yeah, so well, they yeah. will feel pretty uh, yeah, you should. enchanted yeah. with that uh, statement. There's a couple of uh, people here, uh, a few people here in the audience who have kids in high school. So this is a question very personal for them, and it's two, three of them have uh, come in so far. What should they be looking for when they choose a college for their children? Ranking, prestige? Um, I think they should only look for UC San Diego. And, <laughs> and the rest is a detail. <laughs> it comes in that package. <laughs> he loved that one. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I per, look, uh, people have asked me, like, uh, when I was at Carnegie Mellon, people would say, oh, you know, I'm, I really want my son to go to Carnegie Mellon. And uh, the admissions office would, let's say, look at him and say, Pradeep, you know, He's on the margin. Says, what do, you, do you want me to push him or not? And I'd go talk to the parents and say, look, this is not about you. This is about this kid, 18-year-old. If you want him to be successful, he's not going to be successful by appeasing your pride and your sense of what the value system is. You've got to cut him a break. Just, I think you should send your son or daughter to a college where you think they'll be, where they believe they'll be successful, they feel comfortable, even though you may not feel right about it. So like my daughter, just two weeks ago, we dropped her off at Emerson College. Now my wife, who's a writer, does not think Emerson is in Boston. As she wants to do comedic writing. Or she wants to be a comedian. She doesn't think that Emerson has a very broad-based uh, education program like Smith or Wellesley or one of these places. So she and I argue. Now my daughter thinks that I don't want her to go to Emerson, which is not true, quite the opposite. My wife did not because she wanted her to be in a broad base. I said, no, we're gonna send her to a place where she's comfortable and she's gonna be focused on doing well. I don't care what that college is. So in the end, she got to go to Emerson. So I think that's what we should be doing instead of saying, you know, here's the top-notch institution and that's the only place you should go to. Uh, if you look around, especially this country, if you look at the successful people, they're not all from MIT, they're not all from Stanford. There are people from the University of Kentucky who do as well as, who are CEOs of great companies, or people from Mississippi State, from the Cal, from the UC system. I think it all depends on the individual and were you able to develop your abilities and capabilities in that environment, wherever you went, right? And that's what you should be focused on, so. Okay, last question. Please. We, we had this as an exercise in the morning where we went around the table and we had people talk about their most cherished IIT moment. Would you like to share at least one I, of yours? I tell you, so it's a little bit of a complicated story, but my most cherished moment was not one which one would be proud of as an individual, but it is somebody <laughs> that I was proud of because it reflected on the people who were there. So there was at IID Karakpur, like uh, when I was, this was in my third year, 1977. Uh, somebody published a publication called The Blue Litmus. Uh, I did not do it. Somebody published it. Okay, actually, now I know who did it. Uh, but the jokes in there were all my jokes. Like uh, at the general body meeting, we would like take the general secretary to task, and I was actually pretty tough on the bureaucracy there. So then they say, oh, yeah, you know, you and this other guy, Anil Kuller, the two of you did it because these are all your jokes, so we're going to suspend you. So, and suspension, you know, to me would have meant like uh, pretty much done, right? My parents were not rich. So I went to this professor, I remember YP Singh, and I said, look, I did not do this, and I don't know who did it. So he looks at me and says, you know what? I'm going to ask you one more time, but don't lie to me. If you tell me you didn't do it, I'm going to go find out who did. But if you're lying to me, I'll personally kill you. I mean, this YP Singh, I don't know how many of you are from Karak will remember YP Singh. It was a tough cook. You remember YP Singh, right? Really, man of great principle, right? I mean, you could not find a more ethical person. So him and M.N. Faruqi, they did this investigation, lasted like two months, and they found who did it. And in the end, they exonerated us. And to me, that was really, that reflected the character of my professors, and that's the person I wanted to be. And so it was, politically it'd be easy for them to throw both of us out. I mean, no, seriously. In fact, the guy they found was an RSS guy. <laughs> at, at that time. <laughs> 
But so to me, it reflected the, how should I say, the metal of our faculty, the principles they held on to, the way they treated the students, the notion of fairness. So to, to me, that was very, that still sits with me very well. So. Thank you. This was insightful. I, I got four takeaways from this. I'm sure the uh -oh. audience probably got more. Broaden your perspective. Think strategically. Simplify your message to the audience. And don't be afraid to lead in your own way. Right? Dr. Kosler, this was pretty Thank insightful. You. Thank you. Please stay back. Thank you. And, and Thank you.